there are some things in this chapter that I'm I'm not sure I understood correctly. So um, so if anybody wants to jump in and sort of either elaborate or expand on the things that I'm gonna um, go through, please be you're more than welcome to do so because I am not a special person. I'm just starting, really. I mean, I've done other types of analysis and I've worked with rasters and stuff, but I always think of myself as a beginner in terms of spatial analysis and things like that. But anyway, so let's let's go through with this and I hope I um I hope I I can explain everything. So these are the learning objectives for this chapter, which we're gonna be going through the geometries. Last week we went through um the coordinates chapter. And now we're going through geometries. And I think it's very, I mean, I like that this book is starting with the very basic concepts before going into, um, into a more in-depth analysis, right? Because sometimes I feel like some other books just sort of rush through the, um, the basic concepts. And if you don't get those, then they start talking about rosters and things and you're like, wait, what is a simple feature? You know, so I, I sort of like that about this book. Okay, so um, the learning objectives for this chapter are essentially describing what a simple feature is. And these simple features, sometimes abbreviated as SF, and there's also a package called SF to work with simple features, is a collect, it's different, it refers to different types of geometries called points, line or polygon that we can encounter when doing spatial analysis. Additionally, we're gonna describe operations with, uh, by using these simple features. We're also gonna describe what coverage is and how to work with that. Functions of space or space-time, describe tessellation, subdivisions and networks. And it's just description. It's really nothing in depth about any of this is just so that we are sort of aware of what these geometries are and how we can work with them. So to begin, let's start by describing what a simple feature is. So simple features, like I said, abbreviated as SF, are things that have a geometry. Sometimes properties, so it could be like they have either a date or date time to associate it with that, and other attributes describing said things, like for example, a label. And everything is a sequence of points and lines. That's why it's called simple features, right? So they talk about something called the big seven simple features, which are the main um, workhorses of the spatial analysis, at least um, the basic one. So these, there are additional, there are more simple features, but these are like the most basic ones and the ones that we're gonna encounter most commonly. So we're st we start with points and I put here the, um, the graph that they did too, so that we sort of see it um, visually, right? But what they represent or what they are talking about. So point is gonna be a single point geometry. Sometimes, uh, described, well, not sometimes, but described by the ST point um, function, and which is in the SF package. And this point can be just one with an X and a Y coordinate, which could also be lat long, right? But it's, it's described by two coordinates in a space. And you can also have a collection of points um, defined as a multi-point. And the function to do that is the ST multi point, right? And so it's just going to be a series of points um, just put together in one simple feature called multi point. Then we have a line string, which is going to be two or more points connected by a straight line. So it's going to be like a, a beginning and an end, and they are going to be connected by a straight line. And you can also have multi strings, which is going to be a series of these lines a collection of lines. And we can see that here in the, um, in the graph. Then we move to, um, 
to polygons. And polygons, you can also have one polygon or a multi-polygon um, simple feature or um, an object with multiple polygons all combined together or just one polygon. And essentially what this polygon in, is or what it represents is an exterior ring with zero or more inner rings. So as you can see it here, the polygon for the first um, example, it has like a like an inner ring. So like a, this space is gonna be um, sort of cut out from this polygon. It's sort of like a donut, if you will. But you can also have polygons that don't have that, that are completely closed and are, um, there's a different type of donut, right? But anyway, I always think about food. When did you example? Um, but anyway, so essentially this is just um, an object that it's going to have, that is going to be completely closed, right? And then multi-polygons are just gonna be these closed objects that may or may not have an inner ring all uh, put together in an object. And then we have something called geometry collection, which essentially is just a list of geometries. So you can have, as with any list in R, you can have a polygon, a line string, and a point, or you can have um, a collection of points, or um, you know, combine them however way you want. That's um, essentially what a geometry collection is. And the function to do that is ST geometry collection. And then inside you define it, you define your list, your list of geometries. Um, then an, a very important thing to always remember is that you can have one of these uh, simple features, but their geometries may not necessarily be valid. And what I mean by that is that if you have, for example, two polygons, but they are sort of put one against the other and the in the line that they intersect, um, it's like, it could create um, problems or it could create this thing called invalid geometries. Or if you have a polygon, for example, that is not closed or that it has like a little edge that it's, it could be defined, but it's gonna be like an invalid geometry. And um, so, so we have to always check. I remember that in QGIS, it's very easy to check that invalid geometry and then just fix invalid geometries, right? And that can also be done in R. I'm not really sure how, um, but those invalid geometries can be repaired. And some examples of these invalid geometries, or when I would say, I should say when these geometries are valid, they should look like polygon rings that are completely closed, that they don't have like a little gap or that for some reason the lines the outside lines that should connect the beginning and the end points should connect, they are not closed. Um, if there are holes inside the exterior ring, if there are inner rings that are touching the exterior ring, for example, um, in, in these polygons, or if a polygon ring does not repeat its own path, that's, that's usually like, um, like a big one, right? Like when polygons um, sort of like have repeated lines in its own, in, in, in the exterior ring or something like that. Um, and the other one that I was talking about is like when an external ring touches other exterior rings in single points, but not in lines. So those, those when two polygons are like touching each other, sometimes there could be um, issues there. But again, these invalid geometries can be repaired and it's just something to be aware of. Usually we're gonna get like an error in our saying invalid geometry, or you cannot operate invalid geometries or something where it says invalid geometries. And then the correct way to, um, to go about that is just to go and fix or repair that geometry. It's usually one of these errors, right? How to do that, I think we're gonna learn that along the way in the future chapters, but it's just so that we're aware that that can happen, right? 
additional to the um, uh, to spatial features having an that's like the basic thing that they have to have, right? Like an X and a Y coordinate. But additionally, they can also have other um, coordinates. One of them is like the Z coordinate, which is gonna be as if we're looking at it on uh, 3D, which is going to be like altitude, right? Because we're we're dealing with things in space, you know, on a on, on Earth or on a planet, I suppose, on a, on a spherical object. Additionally to that, we can also have um, measures associated with those um, uh, with those special features like area or something like that, right? Length, something like that. Okay, another thing to be aware of is something called empty geometry. So an empty geometry is going to arise naturally when we're performing geometrical operations. So we can start with two spatial features that are defined, but then when we perform a geometrical operation on them, for example, an intersection, then that intersection is empty because the because it's not defined. I'll explain that with an with an example. They can also vanish when we include non-empty geometries. So for example, let's say we have um one point on a on a map on a spatial area that is going to be defined by zero zero. These are like the x and y coordinates. And then we have a second point defined by what x equals one and y equals one. And then I want to see what, where is the intersection between these two points. I want to um, perform this geometrical operation. And of course, because they don't intersect at any point, right? They are completely separated. That is going to give me an empty, um, an empty geometry. That intersection is, is empty because they don't intersect at any point. So how would that collection would look like when it's not empty? How, how would it look like a non-empty geometry when performing an operation, uh, when performing um, a geometrical operation like intersect? So imagine if you have, oh, great. And now my example, I'm so sorry. I put this example to be random. Let me go back to R. Let me see if I need to do a new screen sharing. Let's go here. Okay, great. Let me open three geometry. Okay. Let me run this again. Okay, so here you can see in this example, I, I just ran this code to generate um, random polygons. So all of those random polygons, some of them intersect with one another, right? Like for example, this one that we see here, these other ones also intersect. Although these ones at the bottom, they don't intersect. So when I perform this um, intersection operation, between all my polygons, I'm not going to get an empty um, geometry because I do have polygons that intersect. The resulting geometry that I'm going to get, if I do this, let me just run it again. I get, I got the random ones. Let's see, okay, here. And then the, um, the resulting geometry that I'm going to get from it, it's not going to be empty. If you see here, for example, I have an object. When I perform this, I, um, when I perform this operation, the intersection between all of these polygons, I call that object I. And when I see the structure of I, it's not empty, right? It's, it, it's um, this geometry does have information because it's going to contain the information of these intersecting uh, polygons. Let me see if I run it again and it's empty. So when it's empty, it should say empty. 
Yeah, so if you see here, um, it's empty. Let me check if I can put this. It's empty, I think it is. It's empty. Let's just check. Uh, I don't know how to see that. But anyway, the, the, the point is that if they are not intersecting, it's going to be empty, right? I hope that example is clear. So it's like here when you see the points, right? Because they're not going to intersect at any point, that E object is going to be completely empty. Okay, moving on to the next example. Um, there are additional geometry types, which are going to be, for example, in addition to the point and the polygons that we just saw, and they're going to be, um, well, it depends on what you work with. Some of them are going to be, um, you're going to encounter them more often than others, right? So we have circular string, compound curved, curved polygon, multi-curve, multi-surface, curved surface, polyhedral surface, tin and triangle. The, the book goes, in detail about what each one of them are. I think the, they're self-explained just by looking at the names, um, but it's not, um, it depends on what you work with. Sometimes you're gonna find them more often than not, right? Depends on how, what type of work you're doing, but these are, um, I would say for more complicated, analysis, spatial analysis, right? It's it's not really the most, I mean, if you're performing just regular, if you're just doing regular operations or a very simple spatial analysis, then the other ones are the ones that you're gonna encounter more often. Um, ST is empty, ah, let's try that. Let me see, because if it's not, then my example is not even ending. ST is, Okay. Let me check. And then let's put I here. False, 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 false. Huh. Wait, wait, wait. Let me see. Let's check here. Okay. ST is empty. P. True. And then let's just check about X. Yeah, they're not intersecting. S is my let me just check what how. This L, oh yeah, L is my vector. Okay, so S, oh no, 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 no. Yeah, I'm making it a spatial object there, and then here, I'm just plotting it, okay. Yeah, I is the intersection of the S. So it's empty, it should say true, Why? Why is it not saying true? Intersection. Ah, Actually, I... what you what you just did is a kind of like, uh, intersection because uh, your eye is the ST intersection. So that means whether these polygon is intersect or not. So that's the reason why all force means uh, any of the polygon is intersect to one another. So that's the reason why you get the force, because uh, there is a mm -hmm. two, four, six, eight, ten. So there is a ten polygon. So uh -huh. it, so you just asked what you just asking is uh, just kind of a uh, does the polygon is the intersect with uh, one of the, the other polygons, but it is force. Well, of course, the because they're not thing. intersecting. Yeah, but uh -huh. but the thing so your eye function is the intersections. So, and then. And then intersection means, and then you can, when you say about the empty one, so that means the force, force, force means it is not intersected to one another. So that actually really says about the four, 
really say about the empty kind of things. Oh. Yeah. They are not intersecting one another, so it's uh, empty. So it's empty. Okay. Mm. Okay. Thank you. All right. So it's um, like I said, I'm <laughs> not a very, um, what is it called? Um, advanced spatial analyst, analyst or something. Like that. I am really just, I don't know, very basic operations. That's what I, what I can do. Okay, anyway, moving on. When we are talking about geometries, right? We can also do operations on these geometries and we can categorize those operations and geometries in terms of what they take as input and what they return as output. So for example, uh, when we do, oh, this should have been um, uh, a separate line here, but anyway. Um, when we are talking about, um, in terms of what they operate on, we can work on a single geometry, which is called unary. We can work on, so that's gonna be just something that you do on either um, like points or just a polygon or something like that, just on one single geometry. When we're working with pairs of geometries, that's going to be, um, we're going to be working with binary. And then NRE is going to be working on sets of geometries, right? So more than two together, combined together. Um, usually the ones that we see, for example, um, like the one we just did, haha, is, is the, um, if we have, for example, a polygon and we ask, is this object that we, defined as a polygon? Is it a simple feature? Is it valid? Is it empty? Uh, does it have long lat coordinates? Um, is this object that we called polygon, for example, is this polygon a polygon or is this, uh, not a polygon, but a, what class could it be? I think it could be, yeah, I think the classes are gonna be polygon, line, string, things like that. Um, so those are the things that we are gonna be just looking at when we are um, working with just one single geometry. So the rest, um, the book goes through these things like, um, like all the measures combined together. So when you're talking measures for binary or unary or N arrays, but I defined or I separated them just by all the union, all the things that you can do with unary, with working with unary, all the things that you can do when working with binary, and all the things that you can do when working with n array. Because I don't know, I thought it was more clear like this. But uh, so, for example, when you're just working with unary data, right, with just one geometry, the things that you can do is, for example, describe a property of that geometry. You can ask for what type of What's the dimension that it has? What's the area? What's the length in case of in case of a, a line, for example? Um, other things that you can do with unary data is something called transformation. And it's gonna work on a per geometry basis. So if you have, for example, um, one point, you're starting with just one point with a single point and you perform a transformation, then you're gonna get a new geometry based on just that point. And the easiest one to see is centroid, for example. So this is going to return a geometry of the centroid of that point. Or if you're working with a polygon, for example, it's just gonna give you the coordinates for the centroid of that polygon. A buffer, the same thing, right? If you have a point, then it's gonna estimate as well, usually a circular buffer. I don't know if you can define, because in QGIS, I, I believe you can, you can do like a set it if you want it to be like a square buffer or something like that. I don't know if you can do that in R, I'm sure you can, I've never done it. But um, so it's essentially what this is, is you're going to set a radius 
for that buffer and that it's going to just sort of um, create a buffer around it. So if you have, do you want me to, to draw or do you want to do something here, uh, Conte? I, I, I saw you were trying to draw something. You um, can go ahead. Yeah, we saw just buffer is uh, when we know about the points and then try to like a circular. This is a quite quite typical example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as you can as you can say, we can also about the kind of a kind of a square kind of buffer. And also maybe if you have a kind of a for example, because in the in a urban planning area. Mm -hmm. Maybe there is a kind of a type of the road like this. Mm -hmm. And then there is a maybe transit station in here. And then we can actually also do the, what is called the network distance buffer based on the this road network. And yeah. then we can, we can draw the, some kind of an irregular kind of a buffer area based yeah. on the road network, based on the walking distance or bike distance, et cetera, so, yeah. Exactly, so essentially what this is saying is that it's just, you're gonna work with a, with a geometry, you're gonna start mm -hmm. with a geometry. So a polygon, um, multi-point uh, uh, geometry, something like that. And then you're going to perform a transformation which is gonna give you a new geometry. There are a lot of them. I, yeah. I put here the, um, all the ones that are in the book, I just essentially just copied the yeah. um, mm. the table, and yes, right. it's and then at the end because there are many many. I don't know if you want us to go through all of them. No, 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 no. The example that we have yeah. here in, I guess yeah. we can go through at least the ones that I've used the most. Um, yeah. This is the graph that is in the book. That so the example. So again. For if you have like a collection of points here, mm. here on the first um, on yeah. the first one, and then you just want to do the convex hole, um, which is essentially just build a polygon around the outer points, right? So yeah. it's not going to include this one because this one is mm. going to be inside. Or if you're going to do whatever other kind of operation with this geometry that you have. Hmm. Um, out of all of them here, um, there are many that I haven't used. So this was um, so this was kind of interesting. So let me see. So this wrap date line, for example, I've never used it. Cut into pieces that no longer cover or cross the date line. No, no. Yeah, I've never used that one. It's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Actually, that one is actually used for the when we have uh, some kind of a time series trajectory data, like a like a mm -hmm. movement, like a immigration of the birds, like a winter birds or those kind of things. And then when we thinking about the their 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 move movement, like uh, how they move to the maybe mm -hmm. south to north, like a birds. So yeah. those are the when we can use like a split the uh, split the line segment based on the date timeline. But based on the date, exactly. So I didn't know that this existed, which is why. Yeah. I always say, I love this type of book clubs because yeah. I have, like I said, I, I I've done some spatial analysis, okay. um, and I've taught myself how to do them. But then when you read these things, you're like, oh, so that can be done. And I didn't know, you know? Yeah, yeah. So it's 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 eye-opening in a way. But yeah, I work with, I'm an ecologist. So I completely understand what you say with this um, birds migration example, right? So if you have, and then you can sort of, um, if you have or, the project- Or some kind of a, some kind of a vehicle, like a, Maybe in my in my field, like a uh, transportation, maybe autonomous vehicle routes over mm -hmm. time, and then uh, when we have a uh, stacking all of the, these kind of uh, routes, and then uh, we can see the we can split those things as a dateline, and then I uh, try to working on those things. In yeah, the, as a exactly. Segment. So just yeah. um, yeah. like just give me the ones that are for one month or for mm -hmm. a yeah, year, right? right? Yeah. Instead of seeing yeah. all the yeah. Mm. 
in boxes are very big to include there. Okay, wait, what did you put here, Derek? Um, some country bounding boxes are very big to include their islands or wrap dateline might help quickly form separate objects. Yeah, I suppose if, if they have date, if, if they have time, right? Mm -hmm. Dateline. Longer closing cost, yeah, according to the pieces, yes. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, okay, then boundary, I think it's self-explanatory, convex hole, we just saw an example. Mm -hmm. This one I use a lot with them in my, uh, actually in my line of work, but Line merge, so you're just merging um, different lines, make valid. Oh, that's the one for the invalid geometry. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, creating nodes, which mm -hmm. for networks, like you just said, points on a surface, mm -hmm. polygonize. Yeah, yeah segmentize, uh, simplify, uh, split. Oh, yeah, there are a lot, right? A lot of, of interesting yeah. things that you can do here. Um, I'm sure we're going to use some of them throughout the following chapters. Yeah. Actually, for me, yeah. when you're looking at the dead, those three figures at the bottom. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, actually, the right one, like uh, the, uh, the Looney triangulation is what is called team network. Uh -huh. And then the, the uh, middle one is the uh, Borore polygon means like, uh, okay, for example, for each point, that, point, yeah, each points. Maybe whenever you have okay, here is the random random points in here, for example, and then uh, what Bonori polygon means is uh, it actually calculate the all of the distance through the all the points, okay, mm -hmm. and then actually in from here, the closest point is this, right? Yeah. So that actually creates the this polygon. So inside inside the any any points inside the this polygon, the closest point is the this. Ah, create a polygon. Yeah, create a polygon. Polygon distance is the the distance is the point is the closest point. So maybe. If, Within the within the this polygon, if you have a this this point random point, uh -huh. closest the point is this, right? Yeah. And then like okay, wait, what about here? Here is the closest when we measure the, all the distance of the point, this one gonna be the closest point. So we actually boundary and create the polygons. And then inside the polygon, any location of the random points is the closest point is the that that polygon uh, that points within the that polygon. So we usually use this about what is called the proximal analysis, mm -hmm. like uh, like estimating the service area for the, some specific facility. Like uh, for example, assuming that this point is uh, maybe location of the hospital. Mm -hmm. And then when we know, know when we want to know about the, what's the potential service area for the that hospital, which means uh, like uh, any here any residential location from inside of this polygon, mm -hmm. they usually tend to be used to this hospital because it is uh, the closest hospital they can use. Those kind of a uh, service area like approximately distance analysis can be used, can be conducted by using the, these kind of approaches. So like a service area, kind of like, mm -hmm. a, yeah. Or maybe maybe we can also think about the, some kind of a, like a, in case of the animal mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. try to avoid the, assuming that the, these are the location of the animals, they, they usually stay and then how they, how we can divide the boundary to avoid their avoid the, their overlapping of the their 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 area, you know, mm -hmm. not overlapping. So that's the kind of another way to use it. This one. So usually this is uh, usually for the kind of uh, analyzing the service area kind of analysis. And then uh, this the right one is uh, just kind of a team network is a uh, just kind of a 
geospatial network or social network kind of analysis. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's the what I know. Actually, I use a lot for the middle one because oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so it is very very useful <laughs> for me. Mm. Yeah, and also mm -hmm. for example, in this case, maybe if you if each point has a kind of a attributes, mm -hmm. in that case we can actually color this kind of a polygon depending on the, this attribute as a weight variable mm -hmm. to, 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 to represent some kind of a influence area of the map to visualizing purposes. So yeah, that's the kind of things. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's what I wanna talk about. Yeah. yeah, just keep going on. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. No, 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 please. Yeah. We're learning here. That's the beauty of the book club, right? That we are having a conversation. It's not just a lecture. So uh, no, no, please feel free to add or expand on what I'm, I'm, I'm going through. Mm -hmm. So when we are working with binary um, operations or binary um, geometries, which means uh, working with two, right? With two geometries, then we are going to, for example, do things like this, like, these are called binary predicates, which means we want to see um, if, for example, a set of points are contained or which sets of points, if I have, um, let me see if I can annotate like you were doing. I'll use a different color. Um, so if I have a series of points like this, right, and I want to see um, which ones are contained in this polygon in this circle that I just did, created, right? So that would be contains, um, or we can see if um, if one of them crosses another one, or if it doesn't, um, if there are points in common, or if there are no points in common. So this is just essentially saying, let's do, something with two geometries, right? Um, and these are intersect like what we just created a little bit um, ago, overlaps, relate, things like that. We can also um, sort of estimate uh, distance between binary, uh, between binary um, geometries. And this distance is going to return of course, the distance between two geometries, right? Like what's the distance between two points, between two polygons, between a polygon and a line, something like that. And then again, we can do some transformations, which this is going to return a new geometry based on a pair of geometries, which would be um, if what we were doing um, essentially up let me do the this thing again. Okay, so if I start with this intersection, with this uh, polygon, and then I have another one, and I say the intersection, what I'm gonna get in return is gonna be this, right? It's just gonna be this, the intersection between these two polygons, if I understand correctly. If I say union, for example, it's gonna be, it's gonna give me a new geometry, which is gonna have, the union of both of these polygons combined together. And if I do the difference, it's gonna be the, let me clear this. And if I do the difference, let's say between these two, then it's gonna remove the overlap of one of them. So then it would be, oh, not that, but, sort of that, I think, right? The geometries of the first after removing the overlap of the second geometry. So then that would be that. So if we start with the, let's put them in color, let's say. If I start with this one and then this one right here, where they overlap, it's gonna be this. So then that's what it's gonna subtract, right? Like the difference. So it's gonna give me just the, um, the first one that I draw, which if I draw it again, it would be just this one, right? Without 
this pink area where they intersect. Um, little drawings. And then let's go through the other ones. Um, and I, I like that they put here in the book these um, the operators for each one of them because I always forget them um, or confuse them when doing these kinds of things. And then we have, when we're working with an array, which is gonna be not just two geometries, now we're working with more than two. So what we have with this or what we can do with this is gonna be um, transformations again, getting a new geometry, getting a new, a new um, object based on working with this bunch of geometries that we were working with, three polygons together, four, 20, 100, whatever. So the first one, it's gonna be um, union, for example, and then it's gonna be combining this uh, multi-geometry that we have, this multi-object geometry that we have, and then giving us the union of all of them together. The intersection would be to operate sequentially and this sequentially, I think it's important, right? Because then we sort of want to understand what sequence is going to go through, but um, the intersection or the difference between uh, multiple geometries together. And I put here an example. Let's see. So we start with three geometries, which are going to be these three polygons. And then when we perform so we start with um, with those three uh, polygons, and then I did. Oh, I don't know why the code is not here. I think I did a an intersection, if I'm not mistaken. Let me just check my code real quick. Um, yeah, I did intersection. Okay, so. What I'm going to get in return is going to be this object that has now seven features, this geometry that has seven features, because it's going to be one for this part right here. Oops, one for, where is the pen here? Okay, so one for this part right here. So that's one. This is going to be two. I should put the numbers here, actually. Two. This is going to be one. Um, this is going to be four. This little pink one is going to be five. This is six. And this is going to be seven. Um, yeah. So all of those are going to be um, the, the new seven geometries that I'm going to get from this, right? So I started with three. And then I end up with seven because it's going to be sort of like separating them, if you will, right? It's, it's just because that's the operation that I wanted to do. I'm going to delete all of this. So um, which here is it's just giving me the coordinates for each one of these new polygons, right? So I start with three and then I end up with, um, with that. Um, this five is just because that's how the first five geometries, right? It's missing the other two, but they are there. <laughs> and then when we talk about tessellations, I, I always find it so I don't know, it, it always throws me a bit because when I say tessellations, I'm always like, what is that? I, I don't remember that. But then I remember to, that, that's like a way of saying uh, rasters. I know that there are more types, but it's I'm just so used to hearing rasters instead of these tessellations, which sounds like a very fancy word. But um, anyway, essentially what it's saying is that for every, uh, well, before talking about tessellations and rasters, we have to talk about the spatial temporal aspect of geometries. So it's I work a lot of, a lot with this actually, and I think all of you do too as of, at some point. But so we have to just define these geometries not just in space, but sometimes in time too, right? Because they could change in both dimensions. So for every space-time point, every combination of spatial points and moments in time of the stage of that spatial temporal domain, we're going to have this single value for that range so that so that they don't intersect uh, in space or time. So they're going to be essentially 
defined in time and space. And that's, um, yeah, so it's it, two points can differ, can have the same spatial coordinates, but spatially, but um, temporally they differ, right? So then they are different, they're different points, essentially. Um, and then the book also goes through something called topological models, which are these data models that guarantee that there are no inadvertent gaps or overlaps of polygonal coverage. So essentially they are validated, right? So it's if we start with that topological model or it's advised to start with a topological model and then um, sort of extract polygons or sections of that topological model that we want to work with instead of building it from the ground up, right? So because that's going to be prone to errors more than if we start with something that's already um, defined and without any um, invalid geometries. But that's as far as they go. I don't, they're just explaining very basic concepts here, like I said. And then they go through tessellations, which are essentially subdivisions of space. And we're talking about area or volume here, right? Into smaller elements by ways of polygons, which when we talk about rasters, for example, is just using squares, but we can also have hexagons. And those are like some of my favorite ones. So the, um, if we think of a raster, we're gonna think about this, right? Like a grid of points um, that they have a resolution, a square resolution, but we can also have instead of that, this is supposed to be a hexagon, <laughs> but um, essentially like a honeycomb pattern, right? Um, instead of having those, uh, those squares. And you can also have triangles too, I suppose. Um, which they, um, I, I mainly I work with this, either square, like rasters using squares or with um, honeycomb patterns or hexagons. Hmm. Triangles I've never used, but I'm sure they have their uses, right? So, um, so rasters are essentially an example of a tessellation. And then when we talk about networks, these are essentially spatial, um, these spatial networks are essentially composed of linear elements that are gonna have a start and an end point. Oh my God, where is my um, annotated here? Okay, so they're gonna have a string that has a start and an end point, right here and here. And then they may or may not be connected to other lines. And these, uh, they will have nodes and they are also gonna have um, a direction saying, well, like when we see subway maps, right? That's the best example of networks when you go to a subway and then this is gonna go like that. And then this is gonna have a direction for that. And then this is a node. And then this is another node, et cetera, right? So those are networks. Um, and they're essentially just explaining relationships or connecting nodes and sort of defining a relationship between all of them. And then, and then that's it. That's, that's all what the, um, this, that, that's where the video is gonna go. And that's mm. essentially what the book went through in a nutshell. Mm. I don't know if you guys wanna add anything else. We have six more minutes. Actually, I I actually mis misunderstood about the, that red dead drawing one because in the chat actually Derek explains about the dead one. So I actually misunderstood the dead one is actually kind of like a segmentation line segmentation by the dates. So <laughs> I think that that's a misunderstood. I think so. Oh, just the, the one yeah, that we're talking about? yeah, the red dead uh red dead line uh the date line is a uh, kind yeah, of like a uh, yeah direct explanation is the uh, kind of mm -hmm. like a correct one yeah because uh, across the date, uh, date line means like uh, some country like a uh, us 
is that U.S. gonna be a good example for that? I don't know, but actually, in case of the U.S., there is a kind of a different deadline kind of things, and then uh, just try to separate those things into the polygon or pieces. That's the how we usually use that one. So it's actually just a you you can we can just look at the direct explanation. Maybe Derek, you can explain a little bit more further in detail. Oh, yeah, Derek, you were, yeah, because you put it on the chat. Can you, because I don't know what that is. I'm confused uh, then. Yes, I agree with everything you said. Like if you have a country like the United States who have some islands near Japan and if you're dealing with the bound, bounding boxes, um, then wrap date line might be able to help you separate it. It's, it's probably not that helpful for what I've said so far because the United States also has Hawaii and Alaska and a few other territories. But um, maybe if you deal with other projections as well, where you you have a, a different center or, or a different placement of the continents, it might be helpful. But this dateline then, what does it, um, what does it, it means, it means like a, like a time zone? The dateline that separates, say, between Sunday and Monday, going down the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Oh, ah, I see, I see. So that would be like, for example, the UK, right? And if you're trying to see the UK territories or the British territories, I think it's called, right? But I'm not really familiar with that. But um, the British territories, and then you see Australia, and then you see um, the UK, mm -hmm. right? For example, and then you're mm -hmm. going to see that. They're gonna be caught by that dateline, something like that. Mm, yeah, Maybe. that might be. Yeah, that might be possible. Yeah. Ah, okay. Gotcha. No, I think yeah. Yeah, I am. Yeah. I'm gonna to have to see more examples about this wrap dateline. Yeah. yeah. In R, because I, I, yeah. I am not really. Uh, I've never used it, but it might come in handy at some point, right? I don't know. The Some of the other ones that I have, like I said, they are very like buffers and centroids and well, actually, Jitter, I haven't used it, but yeah. Yeah, actually in terms of the centroid, we already know that maybe some irregular kind of a feature like this, maybe centroid might be the outside, but the thing is we can actually do that centroid should be the, in the middle or maybe another thing we also think about the centroid means maybe if we have a, this kind of a area and then a, under the, this area there's also a lot of a segment like this and then a, each, each segment has a, some kind of a, like maybe attribute called the populations and then maybe in this in in that case maybe when we try to make a centroid based on the population as a weight variable, maybe centroid is not the kind of a geo, not the coincide with the geometric centroid. Like a, for example, maybe around this area has the highly dense area in terms of the population. So when we try to find the centroid in terms of the, this population as a weight variable, maybe our centroid gonna be near to the this area, not the, not the geometric centroid like this. So actually in ArcGIS, there is a actually function called mean center mm -hmm. that actually allows us to finding, identifying the, defining the centroid based on the attribute of the polygons or points as a weight variable. So for example, if we have a population variable in the each polygon, and then I try to define the centroid based on the population as a weight variable. In that case, maybe the centroid is gonna be different from the geometric centroid of the polygon. So that's the, another thing we can also look at the different way of the centroid definition, I think. Yeah. No, yeah, I'm familiar with like most of them, Except yeah, that wrap date line, but I'll I'll look more look at the documentation and, and see and see more about that. Um yeah, so that's it, you guys. It's it's 
noon for me because I'm in the East Coast. So that means we are done with this week's chapter. Okay. Um, we can then meet next week. And who's going to go? Who's going to um, go through chapter four? Derek, was that you? Uh, yes, I believe I'm presenting next week. And I, I think we're talking about spherical geometries, and I'm guessing that's projections. Yeah. Mm, okay. Ooh, I'm so glad I'm not doing that one. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> so next week Derek gonna be do the chapter four, and then uh, so let's see. So see you all next week then. All right. Bye, you guys. Bye. Have a good weekend. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Bye.